Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. Today, we are honored once again to have uh, Norman Solomon. Norman Solomon is a an American journalist, activist, media critic, and the co-founder and national coordinator of RootsAction.org. He is the author of War Made Easy and is a longtime associate of fear, uh, fairness and accuracy in reporting. His uh, new book, or it's not new anymore, but it's an important book, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. And it's amazing with all that's going on right now, how prescient that book is. Uh, Senor Norman Solomon, welcome once again to Politics Done Right. Thanks so much, Egberto. Let me tell you, uh, Norman, I've been going through some of your work at Common Dream. I know that you write in other places. So for those who don't uh, don't read Common Dreams, tell us the other places where your essays appear, please. Well, they're on um, antiwar.com. They're LA Progressive, uh, Salon, and elsewhere. And you can always find it at my website, normansolomon.com. Excellent. Um, uh, before we, we start this uh, this new conversation, I want to address something. Um, because the subject, when we're talking about Israel and war and Hamas, it is difficult in that those who aren't Jewish trying to talk about the subject, they have to be very careful. Yours truly, I'm a humanist. I'm very careful to make sure that I don't cross into a line that in as much as I am not an anti-Semitic person, that it doesn't come across either as anti-Semitic. So I usually pass most of what I talk about on this subject to my Jewish friends. You are one of my Jewish friends. So beforehand, please tell me a little bit about yourself and your religion, etc., so that we can get this discussion in the right context. I grew up uh, mostly in the Washington, D.C. suburbs, and Judaism was part of our household. And I also, as a child, learned a lot about the Holocaust and was frightened as a young boy to read the stories and see films about the Nazis and the stormtroopers. I feel that I understand a lot of the fears and the worries and the anger that Israelis and Jews elsewhere in the world are feeling right now. Great. I, I am glad to do that. So let's get into the discussion. First of all, I want to give you a big thank you because there are not a lot of people that are brave enough to do what you're doing uh, on Common Dreams. Uh, you have articles, and I, I want to name out some of these articles' titles, and then we'll discuss the, the guts later on. But Israel's 9-11 is a slogan to rationalize open-ended massacre of Palestinian civilians. Hamas is a terrorist organization. So is the Israeli government provocative. Uh, Biden is a genocide denier and the enabler in chief of Israel's ongoing war crimes. Could not have been said more clearly. Uh, the U.S. and Israel agree it's okay to kill thousands of children. What you see on TV, folks, your eyes are not lying to you. Don't let anybody tell you that. Uh, ghoulish euphemism, poetry, and the nightmare of Gaza. Let me tell you, it takes a special person, a bold person, to be able to write that and put that out here, given so much of the blowback that APEC and many other organizations are doing against anybody who attempts to be rational, pragmatic, and truthful. You say. The blowback is intended to make people be quiet to, as you say, not believe their own eyes, to refuse to be rational, and to refuse to have a single standard of human rights. And Egberto, I really feel that that's key. If we have a single standard of human rights in this country of the United States and looking at events elsewhere in the world, then we have a moral compass. We won't get lost in ideology, propaganda, and just the jumbling of standards that so often happens when people, for instance, tint their window on the world red, white, and blue, and perhaps unconsciously feel that some people's lives are more important than others. The objectification of those who are either omitted from the U.S. media screen or put in very fuzzy focus so that we don't really understand or have conveyed to us their humanity, 
that's a system that really discounts the humanity of certain people on the planet. We know where that leads. When we discount the humanity of some people because of their race, religion, ethnicity, the language they speak, the culture they have, that's how atrocities can be sustained. And I, I think that, that, that this is a clear example. Um, help me here, please. Uh, 1,200 or so innocent Jewish brothers and sisters were massacred by the terrorist organization Hamas. Subsequently, over 20,000 plus Palestinians, more than half or half or so of them children. Uh, infrastructure decimated. People forcefully starved. People forcefully left without water. Uh, Norman, please explain to me how our media can present those two stories, which they are accurately presenting. They're presenting the suffering of the Palestinians. But the narrative, it seems to me, is missing. The narrative is missing because of a lot of the buzzwords and the way that the window on these events is tinted. And so we hear the word terrorist applied to Hamas, which I think is is absolutely appropriate. They engaged in terroristic activities. Most of those who were killed on October 7th were civilians. But the word is used so selectively because by any consistent standard, the Israeli government since October 7th has been engaged in massive terrorism and mass murder in Gaza. So to step away from that and to avoid that reality is to dodge a essential human question. Do we justify somehow the massacre of civilians for, and then fill in the blank, you know, any number of conscious or unconscious reasons. We, as you refer to, are living in a moment as we have for, wow, more than two months now, where according to the top official director general of the World Health Organization, there have been 10 children killed in Gaza on average every hour. This should be completely intolerable. It's so outrageous and really echoes some of the horrors that we know about in studying history. And to compound this crime against humanity or to enable it, unfortunately, the US government is a participant in that mass murder by shipping weapons, as the murder is taking place to reinforce the Israeli military by vetoing ceasefire resolutions in the UN Security Council. This is a time when, unfortunately, we're learning more about the character of those who are running the US government at the very top. And it's not only outrageous, but it must inform our future attitude and organizing so that we can turn these atrocities around and stop them. You know, I want to use your own words against you. And this, this is your article, Hamas is a terrorist organization, so is Israeli government. And you couldn't have said it any better. I want to read this to you, my friend. A single standard of language should accompany a consistent standard of human rights, which the world desperately needs. If thoughts corrupts language, George Orwell wrote, language can also corrupt thought. A bad usage can spread by tradition and imitation, even among people who should and do know better. No amount of rhetoric from its defenders and apologists can change the reality that Hamas engaged in mass murder. What Hamas horrifically did to more than a thousand Israeli civilians of all ages uh, uh, two weeks ago, which is when you wrote this, meets the dictionary definition of terrorism. And no amount of rhetoric can change the reality that the Israeli government has engaged in mass murder during the last two weeks. What Israel's military is horrifically doing in Gaza 
already killing several thousand Palestinian civilians of all ages also meets the definition of terrorism. And my brother, that was two weeks after it started. It is now from a few thousand to over 20,000, you say. It really is a challenge to our own humanity, our capacity to organize effectively in this country, and at the very basis, truth-telling. Daniel Ellsberg passed away uh, this summer, and one of the profound lessons of his life, beginning with the release of the Pentagon Papers, was and remains that silence is complicity. During the 1980s, when there was the launch of ACT UP and AIDS activists, there was the saying, silence equals death. And it's true, we enable our government to continue a policy of inflicting through, in this case, the Israeli government, inflicting death on civilians to the extent that we're silent. And unfortunately, there is still a lot of silence one way or another. So I feel that this discussion today is part of the process of breaking the silence so we can have a better kind of policy and a better country and find a way to sustain life instead of destroying it. You know, APAC is on, if you, if you watch cable TV, if you watch network TV, you'll start seeing APAC doing some very clever messaging in which they include that Hamas are the terrorists, we Israelis are doing the right thing, and we are there to protect Palestinians as well. While it, they're getting decimated, how do we, how do we counter that kind of a budget uh, when what they're doing it with these ads as well is making people that are truth tellers like yourself seem like you're out of step? You're right. It's very clever messaging. And it's an echo, and I think decoding it is part of the process. It's an echo of what we heard beginning with 9-11 in response to that crime against humanity to try to justify what followed, which was in 22 years since then, under the name of the so-called War on Terror, as the Brown University Costs of War Project has documented, directly killing more than 400,000 civilians under the name of the anti-terrorism war and indirectly uh, killing a total of 4.5 million people in many countries under that uh, rubric. Right after 9-11, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, said as the U.S. was engaged in its follow-up to invasion of Afghanistan, we're talking very late, 2001, Rumsfeld said, let's be clear, every American, every civilian in Afghanistan is dying because of Al-Qaeda. And so it was a step of past, present, and future self-absolution. Uh, uh, no matter what we do, no matter how many civilians we kill, we have no culpability whatsoever it's all the fault of Al-Qaeda because of what they did on 9-11. Very similar to the messaging we're getting from AIPAC, from the Israeli government, from apologists for the Israeli government right now. So whatever we do, they always want to change the subject back to what Hamas did. You know, former ambassador to Israel, to I think to, I mean, uh, Israel ambassador, I think it's to the UK, Mark Regev. He is one of the major spokespeople on uh, on MSNBC and VC and all over the networks, and he's great at doing exactly what you just said. Uh, we kill, we 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 send blind bombs. We we have we have videos that show blind bombs falling out of the sky, just decimating neighborhoods. And when they ask him about it, he says all of that could stop today if Hamas just returned the hostages and surrender. Yeah. And that's the end of the discussion. It yes, very much. And U.S. spokespeople, notably, for instance, John Kirby from the National Security Council, speaks in very similar terms. 
changing the subject back to Hamas as though history ended on October 7th and really as though history began on October 7th. The years, now the decades, of treating more than two million human beings in Gaza like prisoners in what Noam Chomsky has called the biggest open air prison in the world mm -hmm. to subject people the slow death for many in the confinement of the de facto occupation of Gaza uh, by the Israeli government with U.S. help. And yet you have people like John Kirby and others, including uh, Biden and Harris at the top mm -hmm. of the administration and bipartisan on Capitol Hill, Democrats and Republicans saying that this is all the fault of Hamas. And even now, as you noted, Egberto, we have 20,000 people, human beings, souls extinguished, just as precious as those. If you go to the mall in Houston or San Francisco or New York or anywhere else, you're seeing people who are just as innocent as those who have been slaughtered courtesy of U.S. taxpayers and Israeli taxpayers. And that is the human reality that continues as we speak. A few days ago, Hakeem Jeffries gave a speech, uh, a, a huge speech, and uh, uh, where he he just came in the complete defense of Israel. That it was it was pretty embarrassing because it seems to me that he he lowered himself, he lowered his 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 moral standards such that for so much that needs to be done later, it'll come back to haunt him. Because I feel going forward, while it may not happen right now. What we are doing, in along with Israel right now, I think is going to come back to haunt us. So what I want to ask you, Norman, is give me a wrap-up in the form that tells me where do you think we go from here? Where should we go or how best to accomplish what both, both of us know needs to be accomplished with this story? I think of it as tending a healthy garden that first grows uh, from very uh, small seeds and through the time of thinking and nurturing and working together, this wondrous garden can be created. And that requires many different aspects, you know, the, the soil, the plants, the rain, the sunshine. That's true of building social movements for humanism instead of the kind of barbarism that we're seeing uh, coming from Israel with U.S. government support. So I think a program like this must be supported, politics done right. The kind of media outlets that are progressive, that have a single standard of human rights online, they need to be supported. Our voices need to be heard, not suppressed, by ourselves. For one thing, we should not engage in self-censorship out of fear. We should speak out. We should write letters to the editor. We should write articles. We should speak to friends and neighbors, people in our union or in our school or our professional organization, whatever it might be, and speak out and pressure members of Congress. There are 535 people in the House and Senate they should hear from us directly. And if we don't get satisfaction, we should be willing to have meetings and nonviolently and militantly confront them. As Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of, he referred to the marvelous new militancy of the civil rights movement of that era. And today we need marvelous new militancy, nonviolent and direct, confrontive, to say to members of Congress, when you are voting for and refusing to challenge this mass murder by the Israeli government, supported by the U.S. government, we call you to account. You work for us. We are constituents. We will not be silent. And through all of that, we need to organize for political power. Norman, you put your, your work where your words are, Common Dreams and all the other places that you write, the articles that you write, that are that it it holds back no punches as it shouldn't uh, it's doing exactly as it should i want to thank you first of all for appearing here in politics and right i want to thank you for your work folks this is norman solomon american journalist activist and one who knows of what he speaks thank you so kindly for having been on politics and right 
Thank you so much, Alberto. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.